thank you so much for joining us today um, to give our three YCR hosts a little introduction. Uh, my name is Hannah and I'm a third year student at U of C in natural science. And with me today is Camilla and Justice. Uh, Justice, if you wanna give yourself a quick introduction. Yeah, hi, um, my name is Justice. I'm a University of Alberta Commerce graduate with a major in finance. Um, and I've been with YCR for um, close to two years now. And um, I'm just really excited to hear this presentation and hear what you have to say. Perfect. And Camilla, if you want to introduce yourself as well. Yeah, so uh, my name is Camilla. I'm an environmental science uh, student here in Quebec, so I speak French as well. And uh, I'm at YCR uh, only since December of the of last year, so I'm really excited to hear more about uh, what you all have to say uh, to us today. Awesome. Thank you so much, you guys. Um, just to give everybody a quick recap on what YCR is, I want to thank everyone for joining our Food for Thought series. And if this is your first time here, uh, we are an advocacy group made by students and young professionals for students and young professionals. We believe that Canada can have a strong future in resources, the economy, and the environment. Please connect with us on our social media, such as Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. All of them are at YC Resources. And you can also hop on our Facebook Live if you want to learn more about what we do. Joining us today is Jean Habel. Um, as Ken Rias, Director of Quebec and Atlantic Canada, Jean serves as Canria's bilingual key representative and spokesperson in these regions. He leads Quebec, uh, sorry, the Quebec Caucus and the Nova Scotia Caucus, working closely with Canria members. Prior to joining Canria, he was a senior advisor of public and government affairs at the Association Quebecois de Pharmaciens Proprietaires for two years and the MA for St. Rose um, at Laval for four years before that. Jean holds a BBA from HEC Montreal and is a CPA. In his spare time, he enjoys sports and outdoor activities. Jean is based in the Montreal area. Just before I hand the floor over today, please know that the attendees are encouraged to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A box below, and we will address all these at the end of the session. And without further ado, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today, and I will let you uh, share your screen, and we'll get on with your presentation. Perfect, thank you very much, yes. I will just... Uh... Share my screen, it's not going to be too long. Look super. So uh, thank you uh, to all the person from uh, the Young Canadians for Resources for having me today. I'm really glad to be able to speak a little bit more about uh, the future of renewable energy in Quebec and Atlantic Canada. It's a really interesting time for the renewable industry and I'm really glad to be uh, the director for Quebec and Atlantic Canada for the Canadian Renewable Energy Association at this um, interesting moment in uh, renewables and also in the energy sector in general. So I just want to uh, give you a little bit uh, the perspective of the Canadian Renewable Energy Association. We are an association that has been established since July 2020 uh, when the Canadian Wind Energy Association and also the Canadian Solar Industry Association merged together and we decided also to add a perspective regarding energy storage solution because uh, the perspective about hybrid projects so having a project that is including energy storage and wind or energy uh, solar industry and also energy storage is really important because energy storage can bring additional energy at specific time. So we experience in Canada winter speak. Uh, so in that perspective, energy storage can be a really interesting solution to bring additional electricity when it's needed. So uh, during winter peak where a lot of our electric consumption is important. So what we are doing is that we are advocating and we are the voice uh, on the provincial level and also at the federal level for uh, wind energy, solar energy and energy storage. And we have a broad perspective of membership uh, in uh, our association and we do uh, stakeholder advocacy and public engagement for them. So our members are 
uniquely positioned to provide a lot of uh, important projects uh, throughout Canada from coast to coast to coast. And uh, we can think about uh, members such as, for example, Burlex, uh, we have Capstone, uh, we have uh, also Vestas, Enercon. So we have a lot of various members who are really active in Canada at the moment. So recently we presented uh, Canria's 2050 vision to project ourselves for a net zero perspective by 2050. And all that energy leads to more electricity production and also an expansion of electricity generation to support the electrification of transport, buildings, and industry. And also uh, to use that electricity to produce hydrogen when it's hard to electrify those specific applications. I think, for example, about uh, maybe ship that needs to uh, have a long distance from uh, throughout the Atlantic, for example. So uh, the use of hydrogen could be a really important asset in a net zero world. So a lot of wind and solar energy will be built in Canada in the future and Quebec and Atlantic Canada will have a lot of electricity generation in that region. We did a uh, little forecast about uh, what to expect in terms of megawatt incremental amount of energy in the future. And what we are seeing is that it will go really quickly in the next couple of uh, years and the next couple of decades. So that's uh, the illustrative scenario that we had presented uh, recently in our Canaries 50 vision. So it's an important amount of megawatts that will need to be built. And I think that there's a global discussion that we need to have uh, regarding that specific topic because workforce will be needed to build that amount of electricity generation. There's a lot of important discussion that we need to have with local communities as well indigenous people, local municipalities, and also a global discussion about how to be able to build all those important projects and uh, make sure that we will be able to use that energy in the future to uh, use that energy for a uh, transport sector, for uh, uh, buildings, and also for the industries as well. At the moment, uh, what is really shifting is the cost generation for uh, wind and solar at the moment. So uh, we are seeing that uh, the cost for wind and solar is decreasing a lot uh, recently uh, because of uh, the technology that is evolving and also uh, because we are doing more uh, those kind of projects. So there's a certain economy of scale that we are creating with those new technologies. So onshore wind, for example, and uh, solar PV are decreasing a lot uh, recently in terms of the levelized cost of energy. So it's the cost of energy without subsidies. And we can see that since uh, 10 years ago, we had a really uh, decreased amount of costs for uh, generating that electricity. And this is why we are seeing a lot of more wind and solar throughout Canada. It's because it's really interesting to develop those kind of projects now in terms of uh, analysis with other, uh, with, other, uh, with other technology at the moment. I see that there's a question. Do I answer the question now or at the end? Uh, I don't know what's... Uh, Oh, that's all good. Um, we usually answer them at the end of the presentation okay. so that we don't interrupt your flow. Perfect, no problem. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of perspective of maybe the photovoltaic potential solar in Canada. There's a lot of potential. Uh, we are seeing that, for example, in the Western part of Canada, there's a lot of solar potential, but it's because it's exceptional in that specific area, but there's a lot of possibility for uh, implementing solar throughout Canada. We have uh, a lot of possibility in Ontario and in Quebec near the Ottawa River, and there's also various possibility in the Atlantic as well. So 
yes, uh, Alberta, uh, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan is really interesting to develop solar, but there's also a lot of potential in uh, other jurisdictions as well in the eastern part of Canada. So this is why we are seeing a lot of more solar uh, rooftop panel in uh, for residential at the moment in Nova Scotia. Uh, new uh, procurement proposal uh, that include also solar project in Quebec. Uh, so that's a really interesting time and the, the cost of that energy is decreasing. So this is why we're seeing more uh, those kind of uh, project being presented because of the potential of solar and also because of the cost of solar at this moment. It's a little bit the same thing with wind. And there's also a lot of potential in the eastern part of Canada. Uh, you can see, for example, that uh, near Newfoundland uh, and also uh, in more of the, the maritime aspect than the Gaspé Peninsula, there's a lot of wind potential. And this is why it's really the, uh, the number of projects that are being built at the moment are focused in those areas because of the wind potential. So uh, a lot of wind has been installed recently in Quebec. Uh, it's uh, now near four gigawatts of megawatt that has been installed in Quebec. And we can see also that uh, since um, 2021, there's a lot of wind and solar energy capacity that has been built throughout Canada, but a little bit more wind has been developed in the eastern part of uh, the country because of that potential uh, that is increasing. And uh, what we are looking at in the future, will lead to um, a number of megawatts that will increase uh, a lot in the future as well. Uh, wind, uh, a little bit more, for example, in Quebec, a little bit of solar in uh, Nova Scotia, a lot of wind potential also in Newfoundland. So there's a lot of potential for wind and solar in that region. And this is why it's uh, an interesting time to be active in that sector. We conducted a study with HEC Montreal recently just to analyze uh, the global megawatt that needs to be built in uh, those regions. So we can see, for example, that uh, it's a plus 25% of uh, additional electricity, electricity that needs to be built by 2035 in Quebec and more than half uh, of uh, electricity generation that needs to be built by 2015 in Quebec. And we can see all the other amount of percentage from the other region as well. So it's uh, a lot of project that needs to be built. Uh, there's a lot of various analysis that uh, is there in terms of how many megawatts will need to be built. A uh, huge debate at the moment in Quebec as well. Uh, and I'm sure Camilla, you, you know that debate about the electricity generation in Quebec and also that uh, discussion that is ongoing in the Atlantic provinces regarding, for example, uh, the Atlantic Loop uh, to better interconnect uh, provinces and territories uh, to make sure that uh, we use the electricity at uh, the best optimized way. So a lot of discussion in uh, terms of interconnection as well are being discussed with Quebec and also the Atlantic provinces. But in general, uh, there will be various uh, energy that will be used to create that uh, net zero perspective. In Quebec, it will be wind, solar, hydro, biomass, decentralized electricity. And a lot of those technology will also be in place in the four provinces of the Atlantic provinces. So I wanted to do quickly an overview about each provinces really quickly, just to give you a little bit the perspective about what is going on in terms of renewable electricity in each provinces. So recently the government of Nova Scotia has put forward a new legislative bill uh, that uh, they want to achieve 80% renewable electricity by 2030. And they want to also phase out coal uh, by 2030 as well. So that leads to additional uh, project that will need to be built. Uh, they will launch a new procurement that is called the Green Choice Program in the Q1 uh, 2023. And also uh, they just announced a new target regarding offshore. 
uh, that uh, they want to build five gigawatts of offshore by 2030. It's an important amount of, uh, of electricity, just to give you the perspective at the moment, the grid of Nova Scotia is around three gigawatts and they want to build five gigawatts of offshore wind. So it's an important amount of uh, energy that they want to build uh, and they want to use it for green hydrogen and have an exportation perspective. A little bit what uh, is also happening in Newfoundland at the moment with a specific project that is called a green hydrogen that I will speak a little bit further. So a lot of interest for Nova Scotia in terms of green hydrogen, in terms also of offshore wind. So they really seek to be uh, among the leaders in uh, Canada regarding those two technologies. And uh, we will be, in, uh, they, still, they are still implicated in the discussion around the Atlantic Loop with other provinces like uh, New Brunswick and uh, Quebec. So the actual mix at the moment of Nova Scotia is the one uh, with 40% coal, uh, gas with 12%, uh, no New Brunswick import of 5%, hydro 10%, wind 20%, the maritime link, which is a link between Newfoundland and uh, Nova, Sco Nova Scotia, a little bit of biomass and solar. So that's the... Uh, actual energy mix in Nova Scotia. And what we can see is that uh, the proposed mix that the government is proposing in 2030 will be 38% of wind. Uh, so that's an important amount of uh, wind that will need to be built, but also a little percentage in terms of gas and in terms of, of importation as well, um, mostly because they are discussing about maybe uh, how to more stabilize the grid at the moment. So there is discussion around battery storage that could lead to an incremental amount of wind by 2030. So there's still discussion about uh, this uh, specific element and the new uh, climate action plan that has been proposed by Nova Scotia is now at 90% of renewable by 2035. So uh, there's still a lot of element that will need to evolve until 2035. But as you can see, there's a really important mix at the moment in terms of energy in Nova Scotia that will lead to uh, a lot of more uh, solar and wind in the future. And the solar is really a more specifically net metering. So people that are installing a solar panel on the rooftop or, for example, uh, people that are installing rooftop uh, solar for a wind farm, uh, for a farm or uh, for a commercial perspective as well. So uh, there are really advanced in Nova Scotia in terms of net metering. And that's really interesting to see how it's going to evolve in the future. There's a lot of legislative bill that are presented in Nova Scotia at the moment uh, regarding uh, solar panels. Uh, so we'll see how it's going to evolve in the future. So that's the, the perspective a little bit more in Nova Scotia and it's all included in their Nova Scotia's uh, climate uh, change plan uh, that has been uh, submitted recently, uh, which also put forward additional elements regarding uh, uh, the, the wind perspective and uh, the offshore perspective. Newfoundland and Labrador, another interesting uh, provinces at the moment. A lot of hydropower at the moment. Uh, so for their electricity generation, around 95% or 96% of their electricity production is made uh, with hydro. And the reason of that is that they, uh, since 2007, there was a moratorium on uh, wind production. Uh, so uh, this is the reason why we don't see a lot of wind and not, and not a lot of other uh, uh, electricity production technology because it was mostly hydro and there were also some moratorium in terms of wind. But it's going to evolve and now with uh, the fact that they have lifted that moratorium and that uh, they want to also propose 
a new project that is called uh, New Geonic, uh, which is in Mi'kmaq names of uh, where the sand blows. So it's a three gigawatts uh, project of renewable electricity through wind projects that will create additional hydrogen for exportation. And this is where uh, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has been present to announce that specific hydrogen facilities and that hydrogen project. So if you <laughs> If you see, for example, the amount of megawatt installed uh, in 2021 in Newfoundland, it was 55 megawatts, and now they want to build 3,000 megawatts. So it, you can see that uh, the electricity uh, production in terms of wind will really increase in that specific region. So there's multiple phases. The first phase will be a thousand megawatts, so one gigawatt, and after that it will be additional uh, megawatts to be built on the upcoming phases of phase two and phase three. There's also a discussion around uh, using the crown land at the moment to develop more wind energy projects. So you can see at the moment where uh, the actual land would maybe uh, be possible to implement additional wind projects to uh, benefit the incremental amounts of megawatts for uh, for megawatts coming from wind production in Newfoundland and Labrador. Prince Edward Island uh, is another interesting province because it's mostly wind that is uh, been uh, at the forefront of their electricity generation. So electricity generation means that what they are producing in their provinces. And uh, the electricity consumption means that uh, they are consuming, yes, electricity generation from their provinces, but they're also often importing a lot of uh, megawatts from other jurisdictions. So for example, they are producing 99% of wind, but it only represents 24% of the global energy that they are consuming on the electricity grid because they are importing a lot of electricity from New Brunswick, which will I will show uh, uh, in a couple of slides that is a balanced mix of uh, various uh, technology as well. So they are producing only wind, but they are importing electricity from other provinces that are uh, more diverse that include hydropower and nuclear for example from uh, from new brunswick what is interesting with pi at the moment is they are they are the first or among the first to uh, want to achieve a net zero perspective so they want to achieve a net zero perspective by 2040 and not 2050 so it's going to be interesting to see uh, how this province will uh, evolve in a net zero world uh, the decades before other provinces and territories. For New Brunswick, uh, the actual uh, energy production is also really uh, diverse. You have a lot of nuclear, uh, you have around 44% of renewable, and you have also the remaining coming from uh, other uh, emitting sources. So it's really diverse. It's really uh, uh, interesting to see also the energy mix in that sector as well. And now it's going to evolve in the future. Quebec is also unique uh, with the, the perspective of hydro uh, that is mostly the electricity generation, but also the perspective of Quebec is interesting because they are exporting a lot of electricity uh, in the northeast of America and also are looking to export a little bit more as well in the Atlantic provinces. So at the moment, their actual uh, generation is around 213 terawatt hours. And, and the recent uh, strategic plan coming from the state-owned enterprise Hydro-Quebec that is producing essentially the large amount of uh, terawatt hour in uh, the provinces, they were saying that they need to build at least more than 
over a uh, hundred terawatt hour of additional electricity to meet a net zero perspective by 2050. So it's a lot of additional electricity generation to be built. And they are also uh, making agreement with uh, the state of New York, for example, to uh, export electricity in that specific region. And also a lot of discussion around the Atlantic loop that would implicate uh, the Quebec government as well with uh, the other Atlantic uh, provinces. So uh, it's an interesting aspect of their plan. And also they will have a new legislative bill on electricity that will be presented recently, a global discussion about uh, electricity generation and maybe some discussion about having more on-site production uh, as well. Uh, so for example, a company that would want to build more uh, electricity generation and use that electricity for their, their own use, uh, legislative bill could include, for example, that possibility a little bit more. Uh, so that's the kind of discussion that uh, they're going on at the moment in uh, Quebec. Yeah. But it's all electricity generation. There's a, a lot of aspect in the global perspective of electric of uh, energy consumption uh, that needs to happen. So at the moment, for example, in Quebec, when we uh, forecast the perspective of adding more renewable energy, there's still a global mix of energy consumption. So it's only the discussion that I presented to you, the electricity grid but that the energy consumption in general. So as you can see at the moment, there's a lot of other technologies or energy that is used uh, in Quebec. And it's the same thing also for the Atlantic. There's uh, still a lot of consumption from uh, the petroleum pro product or natural gas uh, that is happening in uh, Quebec and also in the Atlantic. Uh, provinces as well. So it's a really a global discussion about where we are now, where we want to be in 2030, and what are our forecast perspective around 2050. So it's just to give you that the first part of my presentation was really oriented in terms of electricity generation, but there's a lot of elements regarding energy consumption that is uh, also something to, to look at in a more global basis. Uh, our association is more focused on the electricity grid, but there's a lot of reality that implicate also the energy consumption in general. That is a global discussion that needs to happen uh, regarding uh, GHG emission on the transportation aspect, on the building aspect, and also uh, regarding the industry that needs to happen. But you can uh, see that uh, in the energy policy of 2030, there was still a lot of more electricity generation. So uh, coming from renewable energy uh, that would increase uh, from 2016 to 2030. And we can expect that it's going to evolve in that direction also for the other decades in the future. So uh, Canada and also uh, Quebec and uh, the Atlantic provinces have a various energy mix and uh, the discussion needs to continue about uh, the percentage amount of renewable energy in that global mix that will evolve in the future. So there's a lot of number in that slide, but uh, you can see that uh, they will uh, we will have a lot of more electric vehicles on the road in Quebec by 2030, but there's also a lot of discussion regarding bioenergy uh, that needs to increase by 2030 in Quebec and all, a lot of other element that will be put forward in the transportation sector uh, regarding the global discussion about uh, net zero. The Quebec electricity generation map is just to give you the perspective. In the north, it's a lot of hydro uh, generation and uh, in the Caspi Peninsula where you can see a little bit uh, more wind production in that area. I wanted to take just a moment to explain a little bit the reality of Idle Quebec, who is a state-owned enterprise. So 
Uh, it's the majority of the generation of Megawatt at the moment in Quebec has been produced by either Quebec production or either Quebec distribution. So they are responsible for uh, producing a lot of the megawatts, but we are seeing a lot of new uh, members that are producing a lot of additional megawatts also into the grid in the future. But it's a state-owned enterprise that has been established for a long time in Quebec. And it's really a part of the energy aspect in Quebec that uh, uh, we need to consider when uh, we are using that electricity in that specific region. So I, I want to conclude uh, really quickly because I know that uh, we have a Q&A perspective as well, but there's a lot of opportunities and challenges with Quebec and also the Atlantic provinces. Uh, so in terms of opportunities, uh, there's uh, a lot of more megawatts that needs to be built. Uh, half of what we are using right now will need to be built in the next couple of decades. Uh, there's a lot of interconnection discussion with the state of New York and also uh, the Atlantic uh, between Quebec and also the Atlantic provinces. Additional megawatts needs to be built in the future, but it, it's also come with a lot of challenges because the transmission line within Quebec and outside Quebec, and I think throughout Canada will need to expand really quickly. So there's a lot of discussion that we need to have with local uh, communities regarding that expansion of transmission line. And there's also a specific element regarding Quebec and uh, discussion around a specific contract with Churchill Fall in uh, Newfoundland. It's uh, a specific project that uh, the, the contract will end in 2041. For the Atlantic, there's also a lot of possibility uh, all the Atlantic provinces have a net zero commitment by 2050. A lot of them are also an, a net zero commitment grid by 2035. Uh, it's uh, an interesting area to build more green hydrogen in the future and also offshore possibility. But it's also uh, coming with challenges because uh, having a five gigawatts of offshore wind in a three gigawatts transmission line or a three gigawatts uh, already uh, transmission line is a, is a challenge, but it's also a continuous discussion that we need to have with various stakeholders, such as the MiCMA or also with fishermen that will use also the ocean. So it's, uh, it's important to have that kind of discussion with uh, the people from the uh, fishermen side as well, if we want to establish offshore wind. So that's a little bit the perspective. So just to conclude, that's the actual map. It's going to evolve really uh, in a more important way in the future in terms of wind and solar capacity in the future in Canada. So I remain available if you have uh, questions for me. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you.